bonus episode of the Marine Layer podcast with TJ Matthewson and Lyle Goldstein. On today's bonus episode, T. Oscar Hernandez is a Seattle Mariner. We'll break down everything you need to know about the latest trade for the M's club upgrading in the outfield. With that, let's get rolling. And we welcome you into this bonus edition of the Marine Layer podcast. Lyle Teoscar Hernandez is a Seattle Mariner. What a surprise. First really big move of the offseason. Hot stove gets hot. It was made by Jerry Depoto, who does not like to waste a lot of time. And he goes out after what is currently a loss Mitch Hanniger to free agency as we stand. He goes out and replaces him with one of the better bats in baseball who can certainly crush and hit the ball pretty hard, to say the least. There's a lot to like here in the profile of Teoscar Hernandez. 96th percentile on the average exit velocity. He hits the ball extremely hard. That's something Justin Hollander said when he was talking about this trade on local radio today. He hits the ball hard, and that's why they like Teoscar Hernandez the most. 98th percentile in hard hit rate. If you look at all the other contact measures, he is at near the top of baseball, and it's exciting to see what he would bring to a corner outfield spot. Yeah, your top five in the league in hard hit rate, that's going to jump out to any club. How did you react when you saw the trade today? Because I saw it early in the morning and I was nothing but excited. I I was extremely excited too. I was a little groggy. So you see it before I do because I had just woken up. My alarm for my current day job uh, here at local radio station here in Corvallis, I wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning. The trade dropped around, I think, 7.38 in the morning. So I missed the first 22 minutes of the trade where you got a fresh reaction. I did not. So I wake up, my you know, my hair's a mess, I roll out of bed, I'm I'm groggy eyed, the sun's barely up, and I check my phone and I shake my eyes a little bit and I look, <laughs> oh, I have a no- notification from Jeff Passan. <laughs> oh, look, a trade. <laughs> How about that? So it, it took a little a little while for the cobwebs to shake off, but it, I have nothing but positive things to say about this trade. My one point, I'll just start. Whenever you can trade a reliever for an everyday all-star player, you do it every single time. Every single time. 100%. Eric Swanson had a phenomenal year last year, and and he was part of the two-man package that goes back to the Blue Jays. It was Eric Swanson and minor league reliever Adam Mako. So when you look at this trade, Swanson had a phenomenal year last year. His ERA was sub-2. His baseball savant page is pretty much all red. But as we know, relievers are fickle. They can be very up and down year to year. There is no guarantee any relief pitcher puts together multiple good years in a row. And like you said, you have the chance to trade for an all-star bat, you do it. Yeah, you absolutely do do it. That that ERA down to 168 for Swanson this year. The ERA plus was even better at 222. But I'm curious, did the Mariners see something towards the end of the year they didn't like and shied away from him? in the playoffs because he wasn't really part of the playoff um, go-tos for Scott service, which was really puzzling. It puzzled you. It puzzled me, but he didn't pitch in the postseason, and maybe a, a reason, maybe not the only reason, but a reason that they would ship off Eric Swanson to Toronto. I feel like that has something to do with it. Cause you just touched on it. We could not figure out for the life of us, why he wasn't pitching in high leverage situations. He was one of the best relievers all year, really in the American League. He was arguably the best reliever in the Mariners bullpen all year. I mean, there were three guys you can basically make an argument for, but he only pitched one time and it was during that 18 inning game when they had to empty out the entire bullpen and use everybody against the Astros. So that was one of my initial thoughts was despite having such a great year, they must see something internally where they think that year he just had maybe isn't repeatable because otherwise a guy with three years of club control left like Swanson has seems a little bit interesting that you'd move him even for a guy like Teoscar. So yeah, I I wouldn't be shocked if internally in the Mariners front office, they just saw something that said, you know what? I think we can replace him. And that's interesting to think you could replace a guy like that, but that's exactly what the Mariners has do- have done really in the bullpen. If you look at the 2021 bullpen compared to the 2022 bullpen, two completely different sets of guys 
and yet the same results occurred, if not better, in 2022. And they feel confident that in 2023, they can replace that with the guy they sign, with a guy from their system. We mentioned just the bevy of pitching in the system. We haven't even talked about a guy like Bryce Miller, uh, the number five prospect for the Mariners, who's I think projected to eventually be a bullpen arm and could eventually maybe at the end of this year or beginning of next see time in that bullpen as a guy who could potentially replace Swanson. I do know that Justin Hollander said it was really hard for them to let go of Swanson. And I do understand because again, the numbers were phenomenal this year. His fastball and splitter were two of the best pitches uh, that any reliever had in all of baseball. The ERA reflected it. And he will be missed at times, especially about getting lefties out. He was very good at getting lefties out. But I wouldn't get too concerned about that, Lyle, because the Mariners as a whole were very good at getting lefties out last year as an entire pitching staff, an OPS just over 600 against left-handers, opposed to an OPS well over 700 against right-handers. And if you take a look at all the individual bullpen guys, they were all really good against left-handers last year. So I wouldn't be too worried about Eric Swanson going and the for the Blue Jays if we look at this on the Blue Jays side they needed some relievers they couldn't shut down that game against the Mariners in game two where they had an 8-1 lead they could have used a guy like Eric Swanson and now they finally have him in a trade exactly it works out for both sides and the Mariners before this trade I think most people would say they need at least two outfield bats now they've solidified one of those guys with getting Teoscar. So before we dive into all the positives with Teoscar Hernandez, I wanted to just highlight a couple of the reasons on the other side where maybe there's a cause for concern just to look at both sides of this. And and looking at Teoscar's career and, and some of his trends, he doesn't walk a whole lot, and he does strike out at a very high rate, making both him and Eugenio, Eugenio Suarez strikeout prone in this lineup. So his walk rate and his strikeout rate are both well below league average. That is one thing to take into account, especially since the Mariners are a team that are very big on their motto, which is dominate the zone. So that is the other side to this. As good of a bat as Teoscar is, there may be a concern or two. He's not the perfect player. There's a couple of flaws in there, Lyle, uh, and I'm curious to the sh- jump in strikeout rate this year. If we look back at last year in 2021 when he was an American League All-Star, 4.3 fan graphs, wins above replacement, he only struck out 25% of the time. For a guy who hits the ball as hard as Teoscar Hernandez does, that's a great number. He only walks 6% of the time, but when you're only striking out 25%, that's pretty good. That number jumped up to 28% this year after being a guy before that each of the previous three seasons struck out over 30% of the time, and 30% is where you kind of get a little nervous with a hitter, but he was able to bring that down under 30% for his all-star season. He was also hurt this past season. Uh, A stat here in May, Teoscar Hernandez his stats might be a little misleading. So he got injured in April, returned in May, and for the first 15 games coming back from injury, Lyle, his weighted runs created plus, or his offense, was negative 19, so meaning he was 119% below league average as an offensive player. After that, in a 109 games, which is a really big sample size, a 148 WRC plus slash 228, 336, 538. You'll take that line. 100%. His OPS plus this past year as a whole, which sat for the year at 127, that ranked third on the Mariners roster had Teoscar been a part of the roster in 2022. The only guys that ranks behind, Julio, and then Eugenio Suarez, but only by a little bit. So I was going to say, yes, there are a little bit of concerns with his walks and his strikeouts. But you know what? Offensive production is offensive production. He's got pop. He hits the ball really hard. And when you look at his OPS plus over the last three years, 146 in 2020, 131 in 2021, 127 in 2022, you're going to take that. You'll take some strikeouts in exchange for very, very high level offensive production, which Teoscar Hernandez is going to give this club. And if you're really concerned about the strikeout rate, there's already guys on this roster that they plan on having, like J.P. Crawford, um, Abe Toro, maybe, (laughs) that don't really strike out all that much. So if that's what you're concerned about, there are other guys to sort of offset that a little bit. And 
I know Julio's going to improve on this, but him and Julio's strikeout and walk rates were pretty similar. Julio's at 7.1% for the walk rate. Teoscar at 64 Julio's at 26% K rate. Teoscar's at 28 It's not too different. So you can live with it as long as you're, again, crushing balls over the wall. So there, there's just so much here to like for, for Teoscar Hernandez. I'm so excited to watch this dude in a Mariners uniform. He's he's very much what they needed. They needed some thump in those outfield spots, especially those corner outfield spots. I, I was just peeking at what the splits were for Mariners outfielder corner outfielders this year. Below league average offensively in both spots, 91 in right field uh, by OPS plus, and then in left field, 83. So well below average in that those no, the number, at least for right field or left field, wherever they're going to put him, will go up significantly. And the good news with Teoscar, too, is he'll give this team a little bit of versatility in the sense of if you need him to play the corner outfield spots, he can. But if somebody like Jared Kelnick or Taylor Trammell really takes off next year, who are better defensively than Teoscar Hernandez, Teoscar can just DH because this team is in need of a designated hitter as well. So that's the plus side is you can add Teoscar, you can still add another outfield bat and be versatile with this team, giving some of the younger guys room to grow while also having solidified spots if you need it. And they said Mitch Hanniger is still on the table too, which is important. I think you there is a world where you can have Mitch Hanniger and Teoscar Hernandez on this roster. One of them DHs, one of them plays in the field, and then you probably put one of your better athletes in the outfield to sort of offset the fact you have Mitch or Teoscar in the outfield. And I think they were saying today when Justin Hollander was talking to the media that they believe they can improve Teoscar's defense, that this isn't really a, a this wouldn't be a Jesse Winker situation. Teoscar was only negative two defensive runs saved in the corner outfield spots, which is kind of surprising from some of the wording I saw on his defense. But that's just slightly below average. For example, Jesse Winker was negative 17 or 18, I think. <laughs> Playing. I think it was I think it was negative 16 is what I saw today. Yeah, yeah. that what that's a pretty bad number. And remember, Jesse Winker didn't play in the outfield all the time. So it's a really impressive mark to get that that <laughs> low into the defensive run save. But Teoscar doesn't seem like he's quite at that moment. He's not going to win a gold glove out there, but he's going to hit the ball over the wall. That's what they want. Can I just read you two stats on Teoscar Hernandez that just jump off all the page ears. to me? Well, first is just his career at T-Mobile Park. I know we try to avoid batting average as much as we can on this show, but his career at T-Mobile Park, he's hit 357 with three home runs and seven doubles in 16 games. But the one that really stands out to me, he has the second highest OPS against left-handed pitching in all of baseball in the last three years. His OPS plus against lefties during that time is 1053. Paul Goldschmidt's the only guy who ranks ahead of him. Trey Turner ranks behind him. Aaron Judge also ranks behind him. That jumps off the page. Yeah, that's really insane. It it is insane how hard this guy hits the ball. Another stat, I don't think we've mentioned it yet, that I think you and I gushed over this morning. Three players rank in the 95th percentile of hard hit rate and the 80th percentile of sprint speed in 2022. Those three players are... Teoscar Hernandez, Julio Rodriguez, and Mike Trout. (laughs) We'll take that. We will take that. It's going to be really exciting to see this dude in a Mariners uniform. And the thing that made me most excited, we talk about all these stats, all these figures, how many home runs he's going to hit. They said they love how the addition he's going to be to the clubhouse and how what big of a culture fit he will be in the clubhouse as well. And I'm very excited to see that um, and embrace a role sort of like what Eugenio Suarez did this past season. I love that the Mariners do that because they're very, very analytically driven. I'd say one of the more analytically driven teams in baseball, but they care a lot about the guys they bring into that clubhouse and making sure the team gels because anybody who's watched the Mariners the last two seasons it has to pop out on the page at you how much fun this team has. And I don't think anything more than the group dance circle, both after they clinched a playoff spot and after they won game two in Toronto, when the entire team 
did the wind dance on the infield, which was so awesome. And not every player would buy into that in baseball. Some guys are a little more self-centered than others. But like you said, it sounds like Teoscar Hernandez is very, very bought in on team culture. And that's great to hear. And team culture, I think, is a little underrated when it comes to winning baseball games because it helps everyone really believe in each other. Haven't been in too many clubhouses myself as a part of a team. High school doesn't really count as a, a, a opposed to being a professional. But regardless, you can just see the impact it has on the field. We're excited to see Teoscar Hernandez in a Mariners uniform. I wouldn't be shocked if the Mariners make another trade or two before we record our next podcast a week from uh, yesterday, so about six days from now when the next Marine Layer podcast drops. But whenever that happens, we'll have plenty to discuss on the next edition of the podcast. He's Lyle Goldstein. I'm TJ Matthewson. Thank you so much for tuning in to this bonus edition of the Marine Layer podcast. You can follow us on all of our social media at Marine Layer Pod. You can click on the link tree in our Twitter account. We'll take you to all of our platforms, our YouTube, and all forms of social media to follow along with the podcast. We'll talk to you next time on the Marine Layer Podcast.